This is the Tabernacle Podcast with me, Written Bishop. Bet you're wondering where John is. I am too. Uh, he just never showed up today, so I don't know if he's under there or where he's at. Yeah, no John. No, I'm just kidding. I think he's on a trip somewhere with Darcy speaking to somebody about something. So, But I am joined today by the one and only Bo Vore. Bo is a husband. Um, he is a father. He is a veteran. And uh, he's a leader, um, and he's a disciple maker. And so, Bo, what's up, man? Welcome to the podcast. How you doing? Well, I'm doing well, and thank you for having me on. Absolutely, bro. Excited to have you here. And for those of you listening, yes, Bo is married to the one and only Rachel Vore, who is a uh, a popular person on the podcast. Our episodes always seem to have good viewership, so hopefully you can live up to that hype. Um, but uh, big no pressure. Shoes. No big pressure. shoes to fill. Yeah, so, but we're excited you're here uh, jumping in. We're going to jump into Bo's Change the Life story, but uh, before we get into that, Bo, I need to know something from you because I'm getting harassed um, by people, uh, specifically a group of men that meet on a Wednesday night at the Manistee campus. They call themselves a fight club. Um, no, they're a fight club. No shots at these guys. But apparently I've said some things here on the podcast that have been divisive um, in the life of our church. They um, have hurt specific people's feelings, and mm-hmm. I find it odd that as grown men, their feelings are hurt by these statements. Um, but they've said things like, who hurt you? When will you grow up? Um, uh, maybe it's just your trauma. Maybe you you haven't been refined enough. Just some, some things sure. to me. And it's all around the topic. Um, of green bean casserole. Oh, oh. and so this Getting is a group of men right off the bat. that are hurt by my feelings towards green bean casserole and the way that I have spoke about that on the podcast. So I need to know: Do you like green bean casserole, and why not? Wow. So um, <laughs> just before I dive into the deep, deep uh, yes, question, absolutely. Um, I want to say I am. Pro- I'm probably Rachel's biggest fan okay. as well. So yes. she is awesome. But. Um, Wow, I didn't know. I'm off <laughs> guard there. here, but yeah. <laughs> so I would probably say I don't have an opinion. Oh, it's just not it's that bad. Yeah, it's just it's <laughs> one of those things where you just you know you don't pay attention to yeah, it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Uh, you've got a plate of food Thanksgiving. You got to have a little color on it. Yep. So I'm with you. Throw something green on it. But that's the yeah. thing. You scrape in the thing and you put the plate over the top so Grandma doesn't see that you didn't eat it all. Like that's just the way I feel about it. I know how Benji feels about your green bean casserole. Yes, it's horrible. Horrible. Thank you. So, <laughs> well, for with that me, being it's like, said, well, you got to make like it's if you've got only a little bit of mashed potatoes and you want to like amplify the mashed yes. potatoes, just mix it together. Yes. So I'll eat it, but it's not. Well, the thing is, like, it's it's cream of mushroom soup and fr- French fried onions, whatever those are on top, sprinkled on top. Yeah. Just take the green beans out. Everybody will be pumped about it. Right. Like, let's just let's just get let's, let's pl- quit dancing. Gotta here. slip let's it in. Yes. Yeah, yeah, supposed to be good for you. So, uh, yeah, it's supposed to be good for you. That was the thing. And uh, so I think they're on a mission to get me to light green bean casserole because they're, like, going to make it and all this stuff. And I'm like, as I hear you, I appreciate what you're trying to do. I just, I'm not doing it. And yeah. so but that's where I'm at. Tab family, if you like green bean casserole, um, it's okay to be wrong. And uh, and I'm done talking. And that's all I have to say about that. Well, so. Um, as in my in my thoughts, if that's all they can find right. to kind of yeah. you know to get you, if that's like the thing they're going to harass you about, uh, you're, you're all right. Yeah, I'll take it. Yeah. So, but uh, we're going to jump in today, Tab Family, to uh, Bo's Vore's change life story. So I'm excited about that. Bo, man, uh, kind of break down for us just from the beginning. Um, where were you born? Kind of the the home situation, everything like that. Okay, so I was born in Southeast Michigan, born in Detroit, um, raised in a little town called. St. Clair Shores. Um, and I was raised in a family. So the home dynamics was grandma and grandpa, uh, my mother, um, who had me when she was 17. Um, and then she remarried. So my stepdad, and then we had three sisters. Mm. Uh, they had uh, three other kids, yep. uh, my sisters. And the closest one in age would have been seven years behind me. And then seven years after that, so 14 years, they had another one. Um, and so uh, that's how I was raised. Yeah. Um, very much a redneck family. <laughs> um, I'm not kidding. Duck Dynasty, like yeah. they all would, like they're extras on a Duck Dynasty set. Oh, yeah. Uh, love it. Um, had a lot of love from the men and the women in the family. But when hunting season came around, life was neglected. Mm. Um, whenever, um, whenever my friends are like, hey, you know, you want to go golf? Like, dude, when, when we had time, we were out trying to kill something. Yeah. We weren't out. No one taught me to golf. Like, right. <laughs> so, 
Uh, that's the kind of house I grew up in. Yeah, but I think we can relate on that. Like, I think you've heard a little bit of my story. So very yeah. similar. Younger sister's 14 years. Yep. The ripe age of like 12 or 13, we moved to this like ranch in the middle of Oklahoma. And our stepdad got us like shotguns, rifles, bows. Yep. And he's like, if I'm going to have boys, they're going to hunt. And it's like this whole like learning how to like jump into this culture. But now it's like I tell stories. I'm like, yeah, man, like. I know what frog gigging is. Like I've done all these things, but yeah. I still like I'm still the my ankles were out the whole time. My stepdad yeah. will vouch for that. Yeah. I I was the kid that he's like, why does he dress like that? Yeah. My little sister was Miss Rodeo, Oklahoma, and we get we go to like her thing for whatever. It's at the fairground, big ordeal. Everybody's boots and jeans. I'm out there in black skinny <laughs> jeans and Vans, and they're just like, that's Britain. So yeah. Being I'm with you, you. man. Yeah. yeah. So, but I grew yeah. up redneck. Down to the ground, can barely yeah. understand half the things my family says. So. Yeah, but you just nod and say, "Uh huh." Oh, absolutely, yep. 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 <laughs> love it. So, grew up in that situation. Um, what was kind of at that time growing up? What was what did faith kind of look like for you at that time? So, faith for me at that time. Uh, let's see, four, 13, 14, uh Well, my whole life, I remember my grandma always taking me to church. Mm. Um, there was a church that we were involved with, uh, Lakeside Church down in in the St. Clair Shores area. Um, Always go to church, but also had a very strong relationship with the world. Mm. Um, so I'd have a I'd have a Sunday morning experience, but um, all, sometimes I'd be hungover. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of my faith. Mm. Um, and it wasn't until like my later years in my twenties that I really say that I I I dove uh, that God got a hold of me. Yeah. Um, but I had a lot of good youth group experiences. Yeah. So I'd go and have this really great high at youth group and, yeah. you know, come back and rocking my WWJD <laughs> bracelet and, you know, had the 15 uh, different colors right. and like, and, and all of that. But, um, then the world just got back a hold of me yeah. and, um, would go back to, to spending time with the world. Mm. And, um, so yeah, that was kind of my faith. It was, uh, I guess the best way to describe it would be, um, I was, I had a relationship with the world mm. and a relationship with God. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't doing either one of them justice. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's something I want to jump into. One, um, I made a theologically correct version yes. of the WWJD for our students, and it's WDJD. We don't have to ask what would he do. We know what he would do. Yeah. And it's what did Jesus do. And yes. so that's, if you see a foundry student rocking it, there's just theologically correct now. I like that. Uh, <laughs> I, like, so, I didn't notice that. Yeah, every time a, I looked at it, I, yep. I just thought it was the WWJD. Yeah. So that's how uh, I have to correct traditions, but that's because I have my own issues. But um, you hit on something that is interesting for me because we're, when this episode drops, we're home from our winter retreat that we just went on. But that's such a theme that I see in the lives of students is they go to this event or they have this awesome night at youth group, or we have a common ground worship night and we have a speaker and it's just this really cool, like mountaintop moment where they can see clearly and, and, or maybe they were experiencing the spirit of God in their life. And it's just like, they make these commitments to like, man, you know what? Like I'm going to read my Bible every day. Like I'm mm-hmm. going to, I'm sell like I am going to follow Jesus no matter what anybody else says. And then Three, four weeks go by and we're back to who they used to be. And, I, yeah. and, and it's no shots. I was that kid as well. But I yeah. would say like if you could speak like say you're talking to younger Bo or to a young man that's a part of Foundry or even a young woman that's a part of Foundry. Like what would you say to them? Like one, in your experience with that, why was that happening? But two, like advice or encouragement you would give to that student that's yeah. wanting to follow Jesus but struggling with that tension of the world versus their relationship with Christ. Yeah. So the first thing I'd say is you will never find peace mm-hmm. trying to satisfy both. And for a long time, that was that was it for me is I could not find the peace because I, I had two very different masters I was mm-hmm. trying to serve. And it kept me in this limbo, like this gray area, and I wasn't hot or cold. Mm-hmm. So that's the first thing I would say. Second is, is the devil, he's a liar, mm-hmm. but he's smart. Yeah, He's been watching humanity before humanity even existed. Mm-hmm. And with that, he knows how to trap you. Yeah. And he doesn't want you to crash right to the bottom <laughs> because then you're going to find a really hard, you're going to you're gonna recognize, okay, I'm at the bottom. He's going to want you to gradually just, you know, yeah, you, you can skip your Bible reading one day. I know you made a commitment right. and a vow that you're going to read it every day, but you don't need it today. You've got so much going, and he's going to be able to speak like that. Yeah. Um, but second, I would say that we all, um, we all come from tribal cultures. Yeah. So if you take the Britons yeah. all the way back to when the first Britons settled in maybe Britain, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
they, the, the way it would work, the way it does work in a tribal culture, and it's ingrained in us, I yeah. believe, is the younger ones, the ones 10, 11, 12, they would see the ones that are 15 or 16 and what they're doing, and they would say, that's what we do here in this culture. And then all the way up to you, the middle, cl- middle age, and, and then the elders kind of keep an mm-hmm. eye on things. And that's, that's how we are. Mm. So when you're in a culture like a, a church camp, the culture says the right, the cool, the popular thing to do is to love Jesus. Mm. So it makes it so much easier and such fertile ground for God to work in those yeah. ways. Now, when you go out into the world, the world says drinking's what you're supposed to, that's what we do. That's right. what men do, right? Yeah. Um, you know, chase women. That's what men do. Mm. So the world leads you astray. So um, that's why we have these like high mountaintop moments. And then we get back into the world and we, the world just starts telling us what the right thing to do yeah. is according to the world. Right. And then we get ourselves trapped. Yeah. I love something you hit on in a verse that comes to mind whenever you say that is John uh, 10, 10. It says, I, a thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come so that they may have life and have it in abundance. Yes. And I think so many students miss out on the last part of that abundant life piece because we just like – and it's not even just students, adults, uh, parents, all a ton of people just kind of have this picture of God that he's just like this cosmic killjoy. Yeah. Like he's just existing in the clouds and he's pointing his finger at all the things we're doing wrong. And we're not experiencing the full life that God has for us right. in like a full surrender to him. And that's a, something I think that students especially kind of struggle with is that piece of like the world has so much um, – temporary quote unquote satisfaction available, right? It's the quick fix, the microwave, kind of that dopamine hit Mm -hmm. of satisfaction that might be found in a substance or in acceptance or nowadays in a like on a screen or in a share or in a view. But, and so many people's relationship with Jesus is just kind of like this mundane kind of mopey obedience of like going through the motions. And I think that we miss out on that last part of what does it mean for a follower of Jesus, right? A student that's seeking to follow Jesus to have abundant life, to yeah. to live a life full of joy. And I think it's because that tension is we think that the world has so much to offer and we're going to sacrifice everything to follow Jesus. And it's mm-hmm. like, kind of, like there is sacrifice in following Jesus, but he has so much more to offer than the world. And it's yes. stuff that will transcend time and space it's it's long lasting fruit it's not temporary satisfaction mm-hmm. but it's an eternal glorification that's found in him but so many people kind of get stuck in the the seeking of the temporary that we miss what Jesus has for us in an eternal perspective yes. and so i think that that that's a big piece as you is of what you hit on too is and i love the tribal piece because that's so key i think that that that's something that's been I don't know. The Lord just keeps bringing this up in my life uh, and his spirit is just like, I'm getting punched in the face with this like idea of what does it mean to do like authentic life for Jesus in community? Yes. Because I think that that's the key to sustaining that authentic life. Like anybody mm-hmm. can do it for a minute. Right. Or and it was demonstrated to us yeah. by Jesus. Absolutely. You know, Jesus didn't have like a revival in a tent and then like nothing. I think of the demoniac. Right. I mean, he... He was redeemed and saved, and then he was left there to disciple yeah. to the people in his community. Yeah. And he wanted to, he's like, can I go with you? He's like, no, you got oh, work to do I here. love that story. I'd have to look back through it. But when Jesus, because you're talking about the guy, Jesus cast him out, all those uh, pigs All died. the pigs, they yeah. went over the edge. Yeah. So Jesus delivers that guy, tells him to go back into his town. The next time, I can't remember the name of the town. It would take longer study. But this is like one of my favorite stories, because the next time Jesus goes back to that town that's listed— there's like four or 5,000 people gathered ready to hear him speak. Yes. But he'd never been there other than casting the demon out of that guy. Right. And it's like, holy crap, this dude got to work. Right. But and, see, God said, I will build my church. Mm, right? Yeah. He says, to, that's all. he's got that part covered. Yeah. He tells us, go make disciples. Yeah. And then make train those disciples to obey, teach them, and then teach them to obey, yep. and then baptize them, and then I'm going to be with you. Yep. So. When we teach them to obey, then they're going to go out and they're going to make disciples. Yeah. It's not addition; it's multiplication. Right. Yeah. So yeah, that's and that's what that former de, you know he we're still putting that label on him. Yeah. But that former demoniac, what yeah. he did is he became a disciple maker in yeah. his community. Yeah. Love he, that. But when we in America, 
what we we have is this we're all rich young rulers mm. so we have this sense like we don't we kind of don't need god right when you go in mission into third world countries mm-hmm. or you live there they you know they're hand, most of them are hand to mouth yeah they're not consumed with so many distractions yeah. it's i don't want to say it's easier but the ground is more fertile for yeah. god to work in big ways yeah so i think of some of the work that um big life is doing for example mm-hmm. over in afghanistan and pakistan yeah most of the time when our disciple makers who, you know, they're not guys that look like me and you. Right. There are a few Luke 10 people apiece yep. that we found yep. that God led us to, some of them with extraordinary stories. Yep. And then they go out and they, they share the gospel. And a lot of them, when they go up to former ta- or actual yep. Taliban and they feel God's leading me to share the gospel with this person, most of the time it's the guys are like, well, what took you so long? Right. Jesus visited me in a dream Yeah, and he told me he was going to send somebody. Where have you guys been? Right. So there's such a contrast here because yeah. we look around and we have so much abundance. Oh here. yeah. But, and I wrote this down when you were, when you were talking about, um, about the world and mm. the world is everything the world offers is empty. Mm-hmm. Everything. A hundred percent. And all you need to do is, um, so I've, I haven't met people. Um, I've met people that, um, very successful worldly. Yeah. Um, not to the success of Solomon, right? Where he gets, I mean, he had everything in right. abundance, and, and he even got to the end of it and said, "Okay, I did everything. Yeah, been there, done that, got the T-shirt." And all I've got to say is, it's all vanity. Mm. But some of the most empty people I know have won mm-hmm. the world game. Yeah, won the game. Won the game. They all the money, all the all the toys, all of that stuff. Yeah. But they're empty. Yeah. They have no real relationships and they're just empty. So the de- the the adversary and all of his effects on this world, the world, everything they offer you, it's going to seem glamorous for a time. Mm-hmm. But it's just like, you know, I'm talking to a buddy who who had an affair with his on, on his wife. At the end of it, it was all it, it seemed great at the time. But the catastrophic damage it caused and how empty it was, mm. wasn't, it wasn't worth it. And of course, you'd go back in time and do it. Right. So the world will offer you things, but it's all empty. Yeah, 100%. And I think too, like we had a guest on the podcast, uh, his name was, we called him Uncle Charlie, but it was Charlie Alca- Alcock. And he talked about um, the, the piece too that I often have to come back to is you and I are speaking from experience, right? I have experienced an empty world. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what led me to the feet of Jesus as I had hit the rock bottom. I'd realized there's nothing left other than what he may have to offer me. And so like, there's that whole piece where it's like, man, I wish the students would hear this and just do it. But then there's that yeah. other piece where it's like, but somebody, you got to go through something, right? It's that whole piece. And what Charlie, the phrase he used was you can't superimpose your suffering on other people. Right. And it's like, I get that, but man, there are so like, please, please, please. If you're listening to this and you're like, well, I could try it. It's like, these are two guys that have been through it, that have tried it. And so I would just encourage people that piece. But I love to, you hit on something about how the gospel is changing. I mean, the gospel is on the move, bro. For sure. You're a part of an organization um, that gets to see the international aspect of things well. Um, We have some partners here at the Tabernacle, ministry partners that are constantly sharing stories with us of what the gospel is doing overseas. And then John and I are part of a ministry called Forge. Yeah. That's also has a ton going on overseas in some different regions and different areas. But uh, and, I, and last night I got to talk about this with our students in the book of Colossians. Paul, um, he's writing to this church and he says, because of the hope reserved for you in heaven, you have already heard about this hope in the word of truth, the gospel mm. that has come to you. And it is bearing fruit and growing all over the world, just as it has among you since the day you heard it and came to truly appreciate God's grace. Yes. And I just use that as a launching point for our students to understand, like, it's so easy in our culture to become, like, gospel numb. Yes. Like, we're just like, we've heard it. We get it. It's just, okay, cool. It's a story we've heard. I'm surrendered to it. I'm coming to church. I give you 10%. Move on. Tell me something new. Yeah. But what, like, I need people to hear, and students especially, and and anybody really, is that the gospel is moving. Right. And what culture and what the United States would tell us, what media would tell us, what— all this that is that that Christianity's on the decline. It's dying out. It's no more. You might as well pick a new thing because that that horse is dead. But dude, I'm telling you, there is fruit popping up across the world that the gospel is still changing lives. Yes. The country you use as an example, Pakistan. Like, 
I mean, tens of thousands of women that have come to faith in Jesus Christ just in the past year of just how the gospel is changing lives. So I love that you pointed out to that, and uh, that was a fun bunny trail. Yeah, no, yeah. When, well, just to keep yeah. going down that trail, maybe and find another yeah. one. But um, so, yes, I believe what happened, I don't believe that Christianity is any worse off right. than it's ever been because mm-hmm. because that's that would say that what that God's not doing it right. Right. What I think is really, truly happening and what we're seeing is this gray area mm-hmm. where, the truth be told, most people live. Where they're where I where I used to live, where they're not they're lukewarm they're mm-hmm. lukewarm yeah. Christians, and we know what happens to them. But that area is shrinking, yeah. And we're starting to see who who's the real church, yeah. And I believe in every bi- church building, there's the real true church, oh, yeah. the remnant. Yeah. We're here, yeah. We're here. We're ready to serve, and we see it. Um, but it's it's it goes back to that all in thing that yeah. you know God's not failing, yeah. You know He's just he's, he's pruning. A, He's pruning. Yeah. He's exposing. And that's something I think the, the pandemic setters. did really well. Yes. Um, I think that God used the, 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 the pandemic that will not be named on this podcast um, in a really cool way is to prune and to, to kind of get the church kind of back to the bare bones of like, no, this is what it's going to take and this is how we're going to do it. And these are the people that are in. Yeah. And we're seeing that as we're kind of picking back up more momentum coming out of that time as a church, especially here at the Tabernacles. We're seeing the people that are in are in. Right, and there are people that are still coming and are part of the church, and we're pumped you're here. Yep. Um, that are that they come on Sunday and they're wash, winch, and repeat, and that's awesome. And I hope that they'll get fired up as well. But the people, man, that are buying in, like we're seeing ministries grow, we're yeah. seeing impact begin to happen, and so I think that process, that gray area that you were talking about, God has used the recent things that have happened to shrink that, yeah, to show people what's really important, and I think that we're seeing. I'm telling I I am a, in firm belief that God is setting up for a massive revival in the next generation. We're seeing it. Um, I mean, you were a part of the Winter Jam tour with uh, Shane Pruitt and uh, some of those guys that I've been able to kind of build relationship with that are kind of on these youth speaking circuits, for the lack of a better term. We'd get to travel around and speak across the country and all this stuff. And I'm telling you, dude, God is doing something in this next generation. And like, I, I seriously think we're going to see an incredible revival come out of our Gen Z, like 13 to 17 year olds, I think we're five, six years out from seeing the gospel explode, not just in our country, but across the world with the hands of these teenagers being the ones that are leading the way. So, Well, in the gospel, it comes um, under constant duress. Mm. So the gospel spread all along the Roman roads, which yeah. were built by the world. Yep. Um, it, that's how the gospel spreads. Right. And for us to have a time such as this, where there is all the things that are, talk, are, talk, that are talked about in the book of mm-hmm. wars and rumors of wars yeah. and all of that. So yes, I I I agree with you, and I think even I would even say this that even friends of mine or people I know who aren't even Christians, mm-hmm. they just know something's up. Yeah, like something's different. Yep. And we've we've experienced things that in our lifetime, and I think there's much more that we I would never even think of. I mean. Right. That that pandemic, I was almost at it. <laughs> a pandemic, I mean, what a weird time to be alive. Right. Like everyone was just doing things that didn't even make sense. Right. Um, so I'm not even going to go down that bunny <laughs> trail because we start talking about masks uh, and all this is just going to get, it's gonna, you're going to get people uh, listening to this for yes. the wrong reason. <laughs> so, but yes, I do believe yeah. that I think um, we can feel it. Yeah. That. We're just fed up with it. Mm-hmm. The way we do life yeah. is empty sometimes. Yeah. And um, so to that, going back to that, um, that young man or that young woman that, you know, is looking at some old guy sitting around yeah. talking, um, it's, we have been there. Mm-hmm. I have been there. I've yeah. done that. And the image I get in my mind when I'm talking to a young man or a young woman about this is imagine if I'm walking, you know, we're walking down, we're in the woods yep. and there's a trail and you're coming this way as a young man or young woman yeah. and I'm coming this way and I'm limping and my shirt's ripped, mm. my hair's all messed up, my face is bruised, I'm a little bloody and I don't say anything to you as I'm walking past you, but I just look at you and I go, do not go down there. Mm. And I just keep going because yeah. that's usually life. We just walk yep. past each other and we have a little moment. Yeah. Whose fault is it if you keep going? <laughs> right. Like I'm telling you, like yeah. all of it, all the rules yeah. in this book are not, like you said, the big cosmic killjoys, yeah. I think is how you put it. He doesn't need us to follow these rules right. for him to be 
better off or worse off. Right. He's still God. He's still God, <laughs> yeah. whether you follow the rules or not. Yep. The rules are for us, mm. are to help make our lives easier. Yeah. Because every, every rule he has in his book, I can probably give you an example yeah. of the wave of pain and destruction breaking that rule will cause. Yeah. And in his mercy, sometimes it's not as severe. Right. But in his justice, sometimes it's equal to yeah. the, the crime fits the punishment. Yep. As an example, if you steal, well, you're going to, per- I've had things stole from me. Mm-hmm. It makes me mad. Right. It doesn't drum up like godly feelings right. inside of me. You have something now that doesn't belong to you. Mm-hmm. So there's like this, and that's just one little teeny example yep. of, of how sin can devastate. So yeah. for, for us to sit here and say, look, you know, we're trying to tell you and show you in a controlled environment like youth group. Yeah. If you crash the car in a field going five miles an hour, it's better than wrecking it on a highway going yeah. a million, you know, going a hundred miles yeah. an hour. So I think that's what the role you guys have, you and Adam, yeah. um, with the youth group, is that you've got to try to just, you know, n- yeah, have the father's heart. Yeah. Because I have the father's heart too. I don't want, right. I want my son to have all the lessons with yeah. none of the ex- pain right. that comes with it. But how, how do you do that? Like, right. how do you crack the code to yeah. penetrate into that young man's heart or that young woman's heart and say, like, let them really get the message. Yeah. Like, don't do it, man. Right. I'm serious. Don't. It's going to yeah. ruin everything. Yeah. Because you will be coming back. Like, I come back to my youth group pastor and like, man, you were right. Yeah. <laughs> everything. I don't, I'm not even going to yeah. say you're right. You're, yeah. you're right. Yeah. Everything. Love it. Yeah. And so, yeah. So you kind of had those experiences, but you pointed to something that in your 20s, something changed. Yeah. So what, so going from youth group to that point where something changed, one, what happened? Like, where were you? How did you get to that point? But also what changed? Okay. So good question. Um, so graduated high school. Um, I've always worked a lot of jobs, mm-hmm. had a lot of odd and in jobs. Um, in fact, the first job I've ever had, um, I was 11 years old, 11, 12. I sold candy door to door. So I was the <laughs> guy with the tote. Um, I had, you know, for those who are like, oh, well, you know, because some people it's hard for people just to say no sometimes right. they want to be polite. Yeah. So if they're like, Hey, I'm diabetic. Okay. Well, I've got candles. Yeah. <laughs> so I had it all. Got, I it all. Uh. Um, and I had, the, I mean, I had the whole spiel down <laughs> Michigan junior careers, part-time youth organization, keep kids busy off the streets, away from gangs, uh. gang related activity. And I mean, all of it, caramel nut clusters, better known as the turtles, <laughs> bite them before they bite you. And, oh, uh, he's it, got was, it, all. it was, it was, it was, it was a pretty internet interesting experience. Um, and we made some, you know, we made yeah. pretty good living. Feels like a cult. It, it was definitely, <laughs> yeah, it, was, it, was, it was weird for sure. Um, yeah. And uh, just a sidebar too, when it snows up here and I don't see oh, kids out shoveling snow, yeah. it, it just gets me, man. I'm with you. I, I, I would pay somebody to shovel my driveway. Yeah. I just, I'm to I, that point. Yeah. I'm the guy, I'm the perfect house on the cul-de-sac where the plow truck just leaves the pile in front of my driveway. <laughs> oh, so I'm that dude that's out there like plotting against the snow plow man. So right. I'm pretty sure there's movies about that. Yeah, but Spikes yeah. in the road yes. or something crazy. <laughs> yeah. And it's a thick, heavy mo- yes. snow. Oh, it makes me so mad. Yeah. So um, yeah, worked a bunch of different jobs, um, mainly in the construction industry mm-hmm. though. Um, uh, my stepdad had a, a construction company. So even 11, 12 is probably illegal. Some of the things I had to do. <laughs> Uh, working on his job sites and I'm pretty sure he didn't pay me the proper wage, but, um, I did live under this roof. Got a and, seat at the table. Boy. I got a seat yeah. at the table and I had a roof over my head and, um, and then, you know, industrial painting and just yeah. a whole, pretty much every construction job. Um, and then I remember I was, I was 19 and taking a year off, uh, graduated and worked that summer. And then, um, yeah, I remember my mom really pressuring me to go to college. So um, we were driving to the college and I had 800 bucks in my pocket. I was going to sign up for classes and just something didn't feel right, mm-hmm. watching everyone scurry around and sign up. And um, so we didn't sign up that I didn't sign up that day. And on my way back, a buddy of mine, John, called and said he met an Air Force recruiter and uh, he was going to go see her again next week and he wanted to know if I wanted to come. So I did. And we sat down, talked to the recruiter. Liked everything she had to say, went down, took the test and all, and we both joined. Hmm. Um, but it was about a six month wait. And during that time, um, I'm in the delayed entry program. So I'm working out and, you know, eating right and trying to, you know, get a, get an edge on uh, boot camp. Mm-hmm. And, uh, during that time he ended up getting a DUI. Hmm. So he didn't even join, 
funny story is he ended up joining the army a year later, which <laughs> we always have a good right. laugh about that. Um, yeah, so uh, left for the Air Force and went down to Texas, uh, did basic training there, and then I did my technical school there, which uh, security forces mm-hmm. is what I started off in. And um, then my first duty assignment, I remember sitting there because I had to wait to get an assignment, so it was called a holdover. And they hand me a slip and it's, you know, it says, I'm like, all right, got an assignment. And, you know, I wanted to travel the world. So, um, but I ended up going to Turkey mm. and I couldn't even pick it out. on a map. I <laughs> legitimately couldn't pick it out on a map. Uh. And um, so went back home, uh, spent three weeks on, uh, on vacation, on leave, and, and then went off to uh, Turkey. I actually left on my 21st birthday. There you go. But it was there in that time, um, away from everybody I knew. Yeah. Um, no, uh, just a, a place in my life where so much change was happening. Yeah. You know, this has been a year of just change. Mm. I joined the Air Force, met a billion new people, learned some skills. Um, I mean, went through boot camp. Got any good boot camp stories? Oh, I got a bunch of them. Give me your favorite one. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the, what do you call it? Um, uh, the tear gas. Mm-hmm. That's probably one of my favorite stories because okay. you go, you know, so in boot camp you have, you know, everybody coming from every walk of life. Right. I mean, you pick a character out and, <laughs> and for me, um, I, I'm, I'm a self-proclaimed anthropologist, so I love watching people. Yeah. So for me, it was very interesting to meet people that like, oh, okay, that's how you do life. That's different. That's interesting. Yeah. And the, the, um, the instructors the, I don't, I think the training to be a boot camp instructor is like comedy school because they are just hilarious. And it's, it's, I mean, I remember one time, so I'm getting, this is like day one and there was a, a, a guy next to me and he had a big Afro and they called him uh Afro samurai. I guess it's like a, a it's a, in, um, it's a cartoon. Okay. And I mean, they're, they're tearing into this guy and I, I'm, I'm just smiling. And then one of them comes over and he's like, what do you think so like right from the show? Like, what do you think so funny? Oh, am I a clown? Am I here for your entertainment? Oh, hey everybody! Somebody grab my big. I mean, this guy goes off for twenty minutes, and I'm supposed to not laugh because he's right. disciplined to keep a straight face. So um, these guys are comedians yeah. and they're funny. So we're going through the um, the tear gas chamber, and you've got you know the guys who are the biggest, baddest, toughest looking guys, and then you've got the guys who you know they. On the surface, they might look a little, you know, wimpy. Right. Um, but watching these guys go through, and you, it's really one of those, if you could, like, take a picture in my mind to see right. it. Um, when they come out the other side, and first off, the experience is horrible, because <laughs> your whole body is just covered with, you know, hot peppers, basically. Yeah. Um, but, what, you know, I was one of the first ones through, and I just remember looking off, and, and I'm watching everybody come out, and watching... Like the little, the wimpier looking guys come out and, you know, just, oh. and they tell them, don't rub your eyes. And yeah. then I got this image of this, the biggest, baddest guy that was there. And, you know, he's ah, just rubbing his eyes and just rolling all over the place and, and all that. So that's, that's probably one of my, one of my favorites. Oh, tear gas, man. Yeah. That they put you in a awful. box basically. And there's loud noises and they're yelling at you and everybody's in line. Like you're, you're, Do you have to perform any like tasks while you're in there or like, um, when you get out, you have to, you have to be able to put your, you get out of it and you have to be able to put your gas mask on. Okay. So, I mean, there's a whole process to it and you have yeah. to say it out loud, all the steps. So you remember it and you're like, drop to one knee and you have to pull the thing open and putting it on my head, securing it to the latch and like <laughs> yeah. locking it all up and, and all that. So, so yeah, that, and it, that was just one. And then of course, like the obstacle course right. for the, you know, one of the last weeks yeah. and, and all that. So, Love it. but we were air force too. So <clears throat> ask any of my army and Marine brothers, you know, we, <laughs> everything we did was just sit around and eat, you know, bon good food and bonbons. Yeah, that and was yeah. the, I think Clayton, I've had three air force guys on this podcast. So yeah. you Clayton and, uh, Adam. Yeah. So, but so twenties end up in yeah, Turkey. So twenties were yeah. in Turkey. Um, and I'm just there alone. God is is working on me, and um, he really needed to take the distraction. All the knuckleheaded friends that I grew up with, all the bad influences, um, just that environment. He, I really needed to be removed from it to have this this intimacy with God, and just all of the change in my life. You know, having sitting in a small dorm room, having nothing really, and just 
in those moments, in those moments of solitude, because all I did was I worked out and I read the Bible and I went to work Mm. and that was it. And it was in that time where God just worked on my heart. Yeah. I'm not saying that, you know, from there I was handed my halo and everything was perfect. Um, But it was there, even though the seeds were planted with my youth pastor and my grandma and the pastor at church, even though all that happened, yeah. Um, I those seeds were planted, but that's when I really started to see them mm. take root and God do a work in my yeah. life. That's like the text, uh, First Corinthians, where it says that neither the one who plants nor the one that waters causes the growth, but only God. Yeah. And so it's cool to see kind of over time, and it gives hope to those that maybe are a parent right now that have that difficult kid or or maybe a youth leader or whoever that's pouring into a, a younger somebody, right? And it, maybe it's a, a 30-year-old or a wife hoping that her husband someday. But just right. that fact that just our job as um, disciples is just to faithfully plant those seeds and trust that at the right time, God is going to bring growth out of those things right. as he sees fit. And so that's cool. Were there any seeds planted by grandma or youth pastor Tony or yeah. or anybody that maybe like came to fruition? And you're like, oh, that's what they were talking about. So was there anything that like comes to mind? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, I think it's, I mean, I know there's specific examples, right. but- I think a lot of it is just the way they did life. Mm. You know, that, that was, that spoke so much more than, um, than words Mm. can sometimes actions speak louder than words. Yeah. So, um, the way Tony lived, the way he handled situations with us, um, and we, we gave him a run for his money as a youth leader. (laughs) Um, same with my grandma, you know, just her heart. And, you know, one of the fondest memories I have is her prayer life Mm. and just walking in and past her room and, just seeing her sitting at the edge of the bed praying. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it, I'm sure there's like specific examples. Yeah. I can give you one of Tony, which yeah. is more of a practical one. <laughs> but um, just, I, I had good men in my life Yeah, when it comes to Tony. I had good men in my life, uncles and my grandpa, but none of them were followers of Jesus. Right. None of them were chasing hard after Jesus. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tony was. So to have that example of like, okay, you know, he's, he's not perfect. Um, he's raising his kids. He's trying to raise his family right. And he reads the Bible. He's really, truly trying to fulfill the calling that God has placed on his life. Yeah. And so I think those examples more than anything else. Yeah. Yeah. That's what changed the game for me as well. I'm relating to that. I mean, there's a ton in your story that I think we have in common, but for me, it was the same story. It was, I've heard it. But I think the first time I got to see it was when yeah. it changed everything. And it was like, oh, there's people that actually are like doing this. It's right. more than just lip service. So that's cool. So you're in Turkey. Jesus mm-hmm. kind of becomes real to you. You start following him, super into like working out, doing all this stuff. What kind of, what's the next big event? I know you met some lady around yep. that time, maybe in oh, that region. It was a little bit, it was a little, little later. later. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. kind of what, so what's unfolding is like you're journeying through how long were you in? How did you meet this yeah. Your, your biggest, uh, the person that you're the biggest fan of all that. So kind of how did yeah. that all unfold? Okay. So, um, was in Turkey for 15 months. Um, after I left Turkey, my next base was Ramstein Air Force Base in Germany. And, um, so I got to Ramstein Air Force Base and I didn't meet, I didn't actually meet Rachel until a couple years after I was there. Okay. So I was, uh, so I was there and. Uh, I was a I was a security forces member, but then I got picked up for a group called the Elite Guard. Mm-hmm. And what we would do is we were we were the SWAT team for the base. Um, so there's some specialized training that came with that. And then we protected. Um, we we're the um, the sentry force for the headquarters building for okay. United States Air Forces in Europe. Okay. Um, and then one other thing that we would do as well is we would we were the honor guard, an all security force member honor guard that would go across Europe and perform um, ceremonies, okay. funerals. Um, we were in France for a couple uh, events, uh, Rethodone, France, World War One commemorative ceremonies, mm. Normandy, and yeah. things like that. Um, and then I got picked up for an assignment for a short period as the vehicle control officer. So what that was is, so in the Air Force, um, the more diverse you can show your, the more different things you can do yeah. instead of like one job, the whole, the m- easier it is with promotion and accolades and things yeah. like that. So being a vehicle control officer 
for the largest fleet of Air Force vehicles in Europe didn't mean I knew anything about vehicles. Right. But what it meant is I got to wear like a mechanic's jumpsuit okay. instead of the uniform. <laughs> and it was a lot of, it was paperwork and it was yeah. just making sure vehicles were scheduled for their tune-ups and, yeah. and overseeing the mechanics. Um, where I was at was right across from um, the armory. And there was this lady who came over looking for um, my boss, Sergeant Walker. And um, she kind of walked in and, you know, was looking around and I had my mechanic uniform on and uh, I'm like, oh, pretty lady. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, she's, she had problems with her personal vehicle. So she was going to ask Sergeant Walker, uh, he was an older guy and yeah. if, if he could, you know, take a look at it. So me being the, the, the guy that I am, I'm a pretty lady. I'm yeah. going to go ha- see if I can, ha- well, let, let me take a look at your Dodge Neon. <laughs> so I go out there and I'm looking and she's explaining what's going on and I'm like, yeah, okay. And. Like, all right, well, I, I don't know, but it's kind of how it was. <laughs> um, but I will say this, there was a, like, we had a moment there yeah. where it's like, yeah, something special about her. Right. And then, um, after that, I, uh, so she left and I couldn't get her out of my head. And I, as a good stalker would do, I <laughs> looked her name up on the control wa- roster. Uh, it was like the next day. And I remember I was at the video store looking at the, the DVD cause DVDs are what we used to watch movies right. on. And I, I'm talking to her and I'm trying to describe the movie about the the girl who has a baby in the Walmart. Do you remember that? Where the heart's at or something like no. that. And it was a, a gift I was going to get my da- uh, my sister for for her birthday. And uh-huh. I'm explaining this and and she's like, oh, I'm like, do you know, I'm like, do you know this movie? And I'm like trying to give her like, yeah. you know, a softball here. And, yeah. And she's like, no. And I'm like, well, well since I got you on the phone. <laughs> I want to go on a date. So I asked her out a date and, um, like a good redneck, she, I had her come out to the, to the, to my house. And, um, we had where I lived at, it was 30 minutes from base. It was an old farmhouse. Mm-hmm. It was built like, I know it's probably as old as America. I mean, it was right. really an old, it was only American in this little quaint town, Mossweiler. And, um, I had a Mercury Mountaineer and we went, I knew the woods up there and, we went off road in and, and all of that. And, uh, I cooked her a home cooked meal and, um, for you guys, you guys probably know she's from Idaho. Yep. So I'm going to, I'm going to embarrass <laughs> her maybe a little bit here. <laughs> so I cook her this awesome steak dinner with corn, no green bean casserole, Benji, none. We can trust him. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, tater tots. And she's like, I'm like, you know, you're for, and I, I have a, I had a special recipe for tater tots. I'd like put the seasoning and yeah. shake them in a bag before I put them in the oven. And uh, it was really good. And I'm like, you're going to love these tater tots. She's like, I'm like, you're from Idaho, so you're going to love these tater tots. Yeah. <laughs> and she's like, um, she's like, oh, I'm allergic to potatoes. I'm like, no. Nobody's allergic well, to I'm, potatoes. I'm like, that's an impossible thing. <laughs> you know, peanut butter, I get it, yeah. maybe. But nobody on earth is allergic to potatoes. But she held her ground. Um, but later on in the night, she's like, okay, I have a confession to make. <laughs> you know, I'm, I thought she was going to say, like, I have a boyfriend. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it was, I'm not allergic to potatoes. I'm like, so that was our first date, and that's how I ended up meeting Rachel. Okay, you know? yeah, she has a, a story that she told that um, you talked about being into fitness, working out, and stuff. She yeah. told some story about some like short shorts or oh. something like that that she remembers you wore a you lot. You mean my style? Yeah, yeah. yeah. She, how much style? She I had. pointed to the fact that you wore shorts that were well above the uh, length that a man should be wearing shorts. So, do you want to defend yourself? I would. I, I'll explain to, yeah. myself. <laughs> so. Um, uh, I was, so I was really big into fitness and there right. was a point in my career in the Air Force where I was going to go the special route. Like I was either going to go, um, special ops, mm-hmm. um, or I was going to go criminal investigations and all the special ops guys. So this is my defense, all of them, the pararescue men, the tac P's, the pair, um, uh, the combat controllers, you wear short shorts. It's a practical thing to do. <laughs> I mean, you've seen MMA uh, fighting, right? Hey, you, I'm with you. I wear above the knee shorts too. Yeah. So. Well, these were a little higher. Yeah. Up, but, uh, <laughs> and they had a liner too. So like, uh, it was all secure. Okay. <laughs> just for the record. So yeah. So I'm going to title this episode. <laughs> it was all secure. It was all secure. <laughs> <laughs> all secure. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, when I ran and I'm running seven miles, yeah. let's note that too, yeah. please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it made more sense to not wear sweatpants yeah. or, you know, shorts that are, you know, down to my calves. Yeah. Whatever well, helps you sleep at night, man. Yeah. I just know that Rachel pointed out the short shorts. So I thought what bothers her the most though, is the fact that I always would wear high socks. 
Okay, yeah, with the short shorts. Right. Yeah. So for me, it was just more comfortable than the ankle socks. So I would have, you know, they'd be up to my calf, like a proper, (laughs) secure in his masculinity Uh, kind of guy. I love it. So meet Rachel, make her the dinner, go on the date. Somehow you talk her into marrying you. Yeah. And how does that all work out? Yeah. So, um, was there conversations about faith that were happening in that? Like, oh, what, yeah. how did that all unfold? Yeah. So we were, um, we were, tr- we traveled a lot. Yeah. Um, it's one of the biggest blessings I think for our marriage is at a young age while we were engaged, we were able to travel to all of Europe. Yeah. Um, so, but all the time we'd, we'd always go to church. Um, we'd still, you know, we'd go out and have fun and stuff yeah. like that. But, um, is there like a church on base or how does that? So there was a church on base, but we were involved with a church right outside the base, a little Baptist church, um, Pastor Altus. Mm. Uh, I think he was actually, no, I think about from Oklahoma. Okay. He was a good old boy <laughs> for sure. And um, yeah, so we were we were pretty involved in the church. She w- she went on a mission trip with the church to Poland mm. with the girls, and I went on a mission trip with the with the men. My first mission trip. Um so yeah, we were involved. Yeah. Um, we'd always always go to church, um, but we were we were involved. But I still, and I don't know if this is where I struggle with it because yeah. I don't know if it's just where God keeps growing me, mm-hmm. or if it's me being critical on my past self or right. what it is. But you know, I knew that we was often talked about our faith. Yeah. Um, we'd always go to church, but at the same time. I feel like what what we're doing now is so much more right. for the kingdom yeah. than what we did back then. So yeah. I don't know if it was a progression, but yes, faith yeah. was always a part of our of our life. It was always part of us and our and our relationship. Yeah. Um, but what ended up happening is so she, her enlistment was coming up, mm-hmm. and we had we, we were engaged. We were talking about getting married, and it kind of came to the point where it's like, okay, if you want me to stick around, and this is really serious, um, then we're going to, we're, we're going to probably have to do this sooner than later. Mm. So what we ended up doing is we got married, um, in, uh, in a German courthouse Yeah, and, um, with a lady with mustache. I don't know if you can say that on this podcast, <laughs> but, um, and it was, it wasn't anything, you know, romantic or yeah. anything like that. Uh, in fact, I had, I was on a case. I was a criminal investigator at the time and, um, I, she brought a change of clothes. I, we did the we did the marriage ceremony, and then I had to go back to work. Mm. Um, but what we ended up doing is we had our marriage. We w- came back about six months later and had a big family and awesome. friend wedding. Yeah. So um, yeah, that's how it happened. <laughs> Side note, funny trail. She uh, well, she got out and she worked at the macaroni grill. Okay. Right across from the main airport on base. Uh huh. So every person, for the most part, that goes to Iraq, and we were very much in Iraq at the time, and yeah. Afghanistan, um, they come to Ramstein first, and when they come back, they usually stop at Ramstein, and there's a big hotel on the base, and and so there's the only real, real ma- restaurant was Macaroni Grill, and she was a server there. Um, one of her hidden talents is she can write her name upside down. Okay. Have, it's really cool watching her do it. So um, it was one of her... <laughs> tricks at the restaurant, but, um, she made more money working three to three to four days a week <laughs> as a waitress at the macaroni grill than I was making as a, uh, a, a staff sergeant at the time. So, um, yeah, uh, fun little, fun hilarious. Yeah. So you guys are there. What brought you guys back stateside? So, um, as I mentioned, I was a criminal investigator yep. and, um, the next evolution in my career would have been to go from a uh, investigator with this unit I was with to um, essentially a nationwide investigator. Mm-hmm. So they'd come bring me back ho- uh, home for another six to 10 months of training. And then my job would have been if a murder happened, you know, going to the far end of it but if a murder happened on in california i'd fly there Mm -hmm. and spend whatever time i needed to be there until um the crime was solved and then i would move on to the next one yeah and i knew that 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 i was at a major another major junction in my life and um through prayer and conversations um I, i approached my commander and i just i laid it out i said look i just married and this is a great honor but um 
is there anything I can do to kind of cool my heels while I figure out, you know, my career path? I never had any plan. I, I plan right. on being a lifer. Um, he said, well, you can go to Texas and you can train other law enforcement, which he lost me at Texas. Right. Or he said it just like this. He said, you can pick a spot in America and I'll send you there as an Air Force representative. And at the time I was finishing my, um, I was working on my master's degree in business. And um, so uh, being an Air Force representative, a recruiter, mm -hmm. I dug into it. Um, it had a whole bunch of benefits. It was a very tough school. Yeah. Uh, high washout rate. So a high failure rate. Yeah. Um, and like a good challenge. So talked to Rachel about it and we, we decided to go for it. So um, I was picked up as a recruiter as Air Force representative. And we looked at the map and we seen all the places that we could be stationed. Um, and her family's in Idaho. Uh -huh. um, she has family on the, on the East Coast and family in Florida and Michigan. And what we wanted is we wanted to have our own. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to raise a family on our own, but we also wanted to make sure some family was close. So we, um, my family's four hours away. And so they can't just be like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm on your We're couch. Here. Yeah. yeah. It's a, you have to plan it. Yep. So we picked Traverse City. Okay. And at the time we left Germany, she was five, six months pregnant with Liam, mm -hmm. our first son. And uh, we came back to Michigan. We went, um, we landed in Detroit. We went up to Traverse City, my first time ever in Traverse City. Okay. Grew up in Michigan. Yeah. Never been here, but all the demographics and all the reviews said yeah. it was a great place to be. Right. So we came up here, we spent two days. Um, we looked at 10 houses. We ended up finding a house. I went back, we went back to Detroit. I flew off to Texas for another two months of training. She went to Idaho and then we flew back and then we came up here and started our life. There it is. Yeah. So moved to Traverse City, had the sun by now, I'm assuming yeah. starting out. So what was that kind of transition process for you? Like into more, like you were still Air Force recruiter, but kind of, what, what did that look like? Like living away from the base and and doing all that stuff, was that a tough transition? And then faith-wise, how did that go with being a new dad and mm -hmm. stuff like that? So kind of what was God doing and how was that transition for you guys? Yeah. Um, so the transition, it's always, so for me, it's easy. Mm. Um, I like new. Mm. I just, it's just how God's wired me, but it's still a transition. So right. there's an adjustment period. Um, there's a good tension. It's one of those good tensions when yeah. you have, when you have, you know, you're not, comfortable. Mm -hmm. So we're settling in another year of a lot of new, you know, just married, just now a new, new training, new job, new location. We have a, another living being in yeah. our house now. <laughs> this is different. Got to keep uh, this thing alive. <laughs> yeah. What's going on here? Um, this is our first home we owned. Okay. Like, you know, we, yeah. we did the mortgage thing for the first time. So that, that was different. Mm. Um, but the adjustment period I think it turned out to be a good one. Yeah. Um, I loved being a recruiter. I was actually honest. Um, yeah. I didn't, you know, no one can come back and say, you lied to me. Yeah. Like, and the Air Force makes it a little easy because more people want to join the Air Force than other right. branches. Uh, nothing against the other branches. Um, so that part was a little easy. Um, and I'd still had to travel yeah. across the States. Um, I was a trainer for... We had a tiger team called, um, we were, we would train the special operation guy. So okay. someone, you know, the top football player down in, you know, Southeast Michigan, I'd have to right. go down there and train with them to help get them ready for special ops. Gotcha. Um, as far as my walk with God, we got, um, we, we were, we started, uh, going to church at a Baptist church Okay. in our, in the town we live in Yep. Kingsley. I'm trying to be like discreet yeah. about it. <laughs> um, I ended up um, joining the board. Um, so in a Baptist church, you have yep. the pastors or the elders and you have the deacons. So yep. I was the chair of the deacon board. Okay. And that time um, was, it was a time of growth in a, in a different way. So yeah. I think God was growing some other areas of our, of our faith journey. Mm -hmm. um, we got really caught up in the looking good culture. Mm. The looking godly, yeah. playing the role. Whenever I would get up on stage to preach, it was, you know, I had to make sure I was dressed to the nine. And right. um, so, but that also opened up our eyes to some legalism mm. that 
um, we didn't even know was there. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of where the faith yeah. journey in Michigan right. with us started. Yeah. So. so with that legalism kind of seeping in, what did that like personally or like in your relationship with God, like, did you tie some of those like characteristics to him? Like, how did that kind of shape the way you were in relationship with the father, like with that legalism kind of seeping in? So, um, how it worked was when I came, when I first started going to Kingsley Mm Baptist this church, um, which love the people there, great people. Um, here's a bunny trail first. (laughs) When we first came to town, we went to a Baptist church in, um, in Germany. So we thought, well, let's go to Baptist church here. So we found the Baptist church and we didn't know they moved and Google didn't update it. So we were late and we were rushing to church um and in downtown wars are never late (laughs) and i deserve that in downtown kingsley is the methodist church okay and um we didn't know that so we go in and i remember there's a like a poll right here nothing against the methodist church guys out there there there's many rooms in the father's mansion (laughs) um but we go and we sit down and like okay no didn't read the sign had a hard time finding it and we didn't have smartphones over there either. So we're not like, you know, we're doing it the old fashioned way, like looking at the internet and Mac trying to West. remember how to yeah. get there. <laughs> um, and then, you know, the, there's so, like I said, so much new. Yeah. But we sit down and it is a Methodist sermon or, you know, service. service. Yeah. So we're like, they don't do Baptist like they did in Germany. This is a little <laughs> different. Um, but then, yeah. So next week we end up going to the actual Baptist church and, um, so yeah, that's the yeah. that's the sidebar, and I totally forgot what the what the question was even. But oh, just how the legalism like oh, seeped yeah. into your personal relationship yeah. with Jesus. So for me, um, I I was a jeans and a black t shirt. Yeah, like that's all I wore. And when I first started going to the church, you know, we were like the first ones to introduce this during praise and worship right. to the church. So you know, um, I have a story about that. So I grew up in a Baptist church for a little while while my parents were still married. And I will never forget the day we were in a service and uh, this like new guy was there. And it was like a big deal because we were like kind of a first Baptist. Like it was a, I don't know, but it was, it is what it is. This guy came in and he raised his hand during worship. And I will never forget how many people that like irked. Yeah. And it was like, why is that such a, like at how I think it was like six or seven years old. Like yeah. I was still the kid that was folding up the giving envelope and shooting it into the little holes on the yep. back of the pew. Yep. But I remember like people talking about this guy raising his hand and it was like, who does he think he is? Like making this all about himself. Like all like, I, I know like, why does this make so many people mad? But for some reason that's a memory I have. So yep. people talk bad about you when you did that. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> but it was, and uh, it was, it was, uh, it was almost a, it was an interesting cycle. So, um, I would ask a lot of questions mm. and, you know, t-shirt, black jeans. And, you know, I thought I knew it all. Right. right. And, um, as we're sitting there and getting to know the people and we, we just enjoyed the, the, the family there, like mm-hmm. with all this, all the uncertainty in our life, yeah. all the change to have like a stable group, a stable yeah. home, you know, that we yeah. could just, we can call and they're, you know, they're considered, we consider them family. Yeah. And, um, it's actually how I got introduced to the tab too, okay. which I'll, Another bunny trail we'll follow here in a minute. But um, I remember sitting there and I changed mm. over time. Yeah. My t-shirts and black, my black shirts and my jeans changed to polos. Mm. And it goes back to the culture like we were yeah. talking about earlier. The culture there was that. Yeah. And it was predominantly because the congregation was older. Right. So it was more of, you know, that was that yep. era of, of yep. time. Um, but I remember distinctively a lesson that God taught me and it wasn't specifically at the church, but through that I was given an opportunity to <clears throat> lead a Bible study at the Grand Traverse Pavilions mm-hmm. with some of their residents, which is a retirement okay. assisted living community and uh, preach once a month on a rotating group of, of pastors. And I was still in the t-shirt, black t-shirt and jeans mm-hmm. phase. And I remember getting up on my soapbox. And, and just a, another sidebar, right. they don't, these old saints, they don't, they don't need to hear what I have to say. Right. A lot of it's just, they need community. Mm-hmm. People don't visit them. And so I ended up bringing our kids and just yeah. bringing some life into, right. into the world. But I remember getting up on my soapbox and we were going, I don't remember 
uh, book we're reading through because we usually read through yep. a book of the Bible. And I remember telling, um, just on the soapbox, I remember explaining how, you know, it doesn't matter how you dress coming to church. You could wear jeans and a t-shirt because God looks at the heart. He don't look at what's inside. Mm-hmm. And I'm rambling on for 10 minutes. And this little old lady in the back, she raises her hand. She's like, well, you know, I just, the way I look at it is when I go to my father's house, I want to look my absolute best. And I could see this 90 year old lady mm-hmm. and just a little girl inside of her yeah. and the heart to make her father happy. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. And God just shut my mouth. Mm. Like, but you're right. And I felt like this big. Yeah. And the lesson there for me that God had given me was God has different instruments for different purposes. Yep. Don't be so quick to flap your lips yeah. about what you think you know. Yeah. And um, yeah, it was just a humbling moment yeah. uh, how God worked on my heart there. Yeah. So the legalism, it it really did seep in. Mm-hmm. Um, and we rec- we got to a point where we just recognized that um, it was it was probably time for us to to m- open up a new chapter in our yeah. life. And about that time, um, I ran into a guy named Pete Uresco, mm. um, senior. At uh, he had a little motorcycle shop in Kingsley called First Kick. And I had brand, and I had known him for a while, and I had brought, um, I had I've always had motorcycles, and I had this chopper that I built, and um, I brought it to him and had him get, tune it up and just get it yeah. ready when we brought it from Germany, and um, he had we talk about everything, I mean yeah. literally everything under the sun, and I didn't know this, but at the time um, he was he was going to. The, the tab. He was involved with, um, with the men's movement here. And he invited me to a fight club. Mm. Um, and, uh, well, I'm sorry, later on, he, he ended up inviting yeah. me to the fight club, but we would, we would talk about everything, uh, aliens, I mean, going <laughs> yeah. right down the, all the crazy stuff. And then one time I was driving by and, um, he was out front talking to somebody and I was going to the Northland, the grocery store and I just I pulled in and started talking. I'm like, what, what's going on? And, it was another guy from the tabernacle and they were talking about God. And I'm mm. like, man, we have talked about everything. Yeah. But we have never talked about the most important thing. Mm. And um, from that, that's when the invitation yeah. to come to fight club. And um, we ended up doing a couple retreats with the Buckley guys okay. and the Kingsley guys. And, um, but yeah, that was my, my cool. introduction to, to the tab. So it started how long after coming to fight club, did you kind of make the family move of everybody coming to the tab? So we were, um, we were, there's about an eighth month, eight month roughly period where we were, we would go to the Baptist church and that was service that mm-hmm. almost felt like work. Yeah. And then we would hurry up and rush over to the tab okay. for the last service. So we were doing that for a, for a period of okay. time and I was doing the fight clubs and then we had started one yep. at the Baptist church. Um, and then there was a time where I, um, I just, I, I felt God saying it was time, nothing against them, but yeah. it was time to just move on. And so I resigned my position as the chairman of the board yeah. um, and started going to the tab. Awesome. So so what did that kind of transition, another time of transition, right? Coming to the tab, uh, plugging into Fight Club, stuff like that, like in the realm of like a changed life story, like what was God doing in your life at that time? Was it kind of, was he revealing any new like areas that he wants to work in what like kind of what was happening in that what was going on with your marriage stuff like that <clears throat> yeah so um i think god is always refining yeah um there's always as we you know different levels different devils mm-hmm. so as god in my life my experience my change life as god reveals to me more of his character mm. he reveals more of how fallen my flesh is mm. so the closer I draw to him, yep. the closer he pulls me in, yeah. the more I'm recognizing how I have to fine tune certain areas of my life. Yeah. And the deeper my relationship goes with him, another thing that comes with that is the fact that um, my toleration of my own flesh mm. is less Yeah. and it hurts more and it convicts more. Mm. So even though I've, like, if I look back on my time, Five years ago, I would think, man, you are so, you were, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm arriving, I'm getting yeah. closer. And then five years before that, the same thing. But, yeah. um, it's just that 
constant refining process. Yeah. So I don't think he'll ever stop doing that. Right. In fact, I'm, I'm confident that he won't. I'm yeah. glad he won't because we're being made more into the image right. of Jesus. Um, so in the mar- in our marriage, um, we've we've went through all the cycles. Right. Um, so after I left the Air Force, um, this one of probably the hardest seasons of our marriage. Um, this is a change. She yeah. she married a crazy person. Right. Um. So never plan on getting out of the Air Force, but there was a group of of uh, leaders in the community that talked me out of talked me into getting into politics. Okay. And getting out of the Air Force. So I quit almost eleven years of the Air Force. Mm. Got out. We have three kids. Um, Rachel was I think Rachel was pregnant at the time with her fourth kid. No job. The plan is to burn through all of our savings for six months to run in an eight-way race for state representative. <laughs> so we left healthcare and all of that, and we did the politician thing. Yeah. Um, that season was a tough one yeah. for us, um, largely because, once again, going back to the culture, right. I felt that, well, I know God's calling me, into politics. Yeah. But it was more of God was calling me out of the air force, right. which I do believe he was doing. Um, he, he didn't say how he was going to do it. Right. But, um, I felt, well, okay, if he's calling me out of, to be a politician, I've got to look like one. Mm. Got to talk like one. Yeah. So all of a sudden my hair got a little greasier. Yeah. <laughs> my ties got a little tighter. Right. <laughs> um, and I ran for office at yeah. that time. And, um, I lost, I lost sight of what really was important. Mm. Um, nothing crazy. Like I didn't right. have an affair on Rachel right. or anything, but I just was becoming a douchebag. Yeah. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, like, that's our I don't, podcast. Okay. You can say whatever you want. All right. Okay. <laughs> I don't, Benji, if you have to bleep it, I, I don't you know. For the younger viewers There's out been there, worse on here. <laughs> yeah. But I was um, uh, all with this thought that, well, you know, to, in order to do the good that God right. wants me to do, I've got to, I've got to make these sacrifices. Yeah. And the fact is, is, God's not going to call me into one area to serve mm. or, but have me sin or neglect a more important area. Mm. So, yeah. um, so that was a tough period of, of our relationship. Um, but so many good ones Yeah, and where we're at now, knock on wood and thank <laughs> God, um, we're at, we're at a pretty good place yeah. largely because, um, we try really hard to keep the focus centralized on God hmm. and not on us. Yeah. And I love how John puts it, how um, uh, marriage isn't meant to make you happy. It's meant to make you holy. Yeah. I think, I think yeah. he's the one who coined that or he yeah. maybe heard it from someone else, but right. um, cause it's true. Yeah. Uh, during our wedding ceremony, we did the, the three, the cord of three strands yeah. is not easily broken. Yeah. Um, and it's true. So yeah. for us, it's whenever I think too much about myself and all the important hmm. things I have to do, um, and I neglect my bride. I think that's when we run into problems and same yeah. on her, you know, she's, yeah. you know, she's perfect in so many ways, but <laughs> she's got, you know, she's, right. you know, everyone's flawed. No, hundred so. percent. That was yeah. the people always ask. Cause I've only been married for some months. I've learned if you don't say a number, you can never be wrong. Yeah. Uh, so we've been married <laughs> for some months and in yeah. June we'll be married for some years. Yeah. Uh, yep. but, uh, the biggest thing I learned over time was just how selfish I actually am. Yeah. And, uh, and so that's been a huge learning process is man, like how do I, deny myself, take up my cross, sacrifice. And so I think that yeah. that's been a huge learning piece. And it sounds like that's still things you learn years down the road as well. Yeah. So, so you've been married some months? Some months. So um, I would say, and you may have heard this, I'm sure you have, yeah. like three years into it, uh, three three to five, like yeah. there's, that's typically a rough patch. Yeah. Um, just because you do, like you're, the dust has settled from right. everything and- um, but it's, it's, it's just, it's a good example of how God just renews his love mm. for us too. Yeah. Because, you know, we're, we're called to do that. Yeah. You know, if you, you, if you start putting your focus on you and it's yep. self-centered, yeah, man, you miss the mark so much. Oh, hundred percent. hundred percent. Well, sweet man. Uh, yeah, I think the biggest thread that I could pull through this whole thing, um, was just this commitment to continue resetting back to Jesus. I think you see that through your story and uh, and I appreciate you coming on and, and sharing that with us. If there's anything kind of that you would close with or a closing thought, because I think the demographic that uh, you can speak to uh, specifically through 
your story and uh, and through um, from beginning to end is kind of this idea that that God is going to be there and He's not the one that moves; we are. Yeah. And uh, and so if there was an encouragement you could give to men, to husbands, to students, um, to anybody out there that um, maybe isn't following Jesus but wants to, or maybe they've been following Jesus for a while and it's gotten stale or they've slipped into some kind of other space, man, just like a closing encouragement that you would extend to those people that are listening to the podcast. Yeah. So um, what I would say is there is no half-hearted followers of Jesus Christ. Mm. It will cost you everything, Mm. but you'll gain everything in return. Yeah. So for those that are in that gray area, for those that are multitasking their relationship with the world and with God, you got to choose like mm. the rich young ruler did. He, he's, you were presented with the choice. Yeah. We cannot be half-hearted followers of Jesus. And the, the, the woes and the problems in the world today are not because of the bad people doing bad things. It's because of the men that God has called to step up are neglecting their duties mm. and they're not stepping up and they're not fulfilling the roles and stepping into what God called them to. Yeah. So my encouragement would be stop messing around stop turning it into a game and get real with your faith and get out there and do the thing god's calling you to do mm. immediate obedience delayed obedience is disobedience yeah and there's too many brothers out there specifically brothers that are delaying the things god's calling them to do and the the brothers around them are suffering for it mm. That's so good, man. Go do what you're supposed to do. Absolutely, bro. I appreciate that so much. That's such a good word for us today as a church. Um, it'll be a good word for us years from now as a church. So uh, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, and uh, having fun with it. And so, uh, yeah, Benji, thanks, bro, for running the uh, the old production over there. And uh, Nike, if you have any uh, three-inch inseam shorts that you want to sponsor Bo with, I think he'd still probably take a pair or two. So, uh, I would. Yeah. It's going to have to be a little bit wider, <laughs> though, now, but I will uh, take the three-inch. Uh, <laughs> love it. Well, uh, Tab family, um, we love you guys. And, uh, yeah, until next time, this is Bo, Benji, and Britton signing off. Mm-hmm.